I want to talk about those words. They were written some time before Bach wrote the music in the 1630s by a man called Martin Reichardt. Now, he's not necessarily a household name, but I'll tell you a little bit about his life because it's interesting. He was, like Bach, he was a theologian and musician, and I think at times couldn't really decide what he was supposed to do. And he really suffered. Uh, now, I don't know if you know Slough, but Eilenborg is considerably worse. And <laughs> its history was appalling. It, to get to Eilenborg, what you have to do is go north to Leipzig and then turn right. And Eilenborg is, is sort of between Berlin and Frankfurt. And this poor benighted place was struck by the Thirty Years' War, appalling plague, famine. It had the bloods of kings drenched across its streets. It had oppression from Swedish warmongering troops. And even in modern times, it's been flooded. It's been this epicenter of European anxiety, misery, and pestilence for decades. So it's really extraordinary that from this town where Martin Reichardt worked, that we have these words, now thank we all our God. And what an incredible gesture of stoicism and faith that this man should append those words at all. Because shortly after he took his job up, the Thirty Years' War started. It only finished a year before he died. I suppose you might say, well, at least he got to see some kind of peace. But this heroic man, in the height of the plague, conducted more funerals than you can imagine. Now, it's a footnote in my biography that uh, before I was a musician, I was an organist. And one of my jobs was to... That normally gets a laugh. <laughs> um, it still amuses me. Uh, and one of my jobs was at the local crematorium, and I thought I was doing quite well. I did 440 funerals in one year. But Martin Reichert, um, um, he, he covered about 5,000, um, including his own wife, at a rate of 50 a day. And in the end, it was too much to do, and they had to go into big mass graves. And then when the famine struck, he gave away everything he had. He pleaded with Swedish generals to give food to the people and was shooed away, probably at the point of a spear. He did everything. So it's remarkable that he wrote these words. And it's also interesting to see how Bach treats this text, because it's not a normal cantata. You're used, I should imagine, if you've been before and you know these works, to have a bit of continuo, and then there's someone doing a little bit of recitative, and then you have an aria, and then a chorus, and then, and then maybe a duet, or there there's a, another chorus, and then a, a chorale. Very different. There are three verses in this, and he gives three movements. And the outer movements are very similar. They've got a different, obviously, different kind of treatment, different meter, but it's the text sung by the chorus, which are in a balcony here. And what you will hear is the tune that you knew as the audience in, as the congregation, I should say, in Leipzig, the tune that you knew from childhood is chiseled like an engraver puts the words into marble, is chiseled into a cantus firmus, a held line sung by the top part, the sopranos, and everybody else is dancing around in the chorus with the instruments. And then in the middle movement, the second stanza is treated by two duetting soloists. So Bach obviously treats this very differently. It's a kind of monumental work. And I have no doubt at all that he related in more the ways than one to this text and to the person who wrote it because Bach will have seen so much in the life of Martin Rinkart and, and his life, his suffering and his commitment and his sense of the best will come but later. Thank you. 